everybody. Welcome to episode 10 of Kitty Cat Go Live, where we discuss various topics related to traveling and adventuring with your cat. I'm your host, Emily Hall, and tonight we'll be chatting about how to properly introduce your cat to new situations and environments, recognizing when your cat is nervous or stressed, and so much more. If you're watching with us tonight or on the replay, be sure to say hello in the comments and tell us where you're watching from. Questions are encouraged along the way as well. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. Our special guest for the evening is Ingrid Johnson from Fundamentally Feline. Ingrid is a certified cat behavior consultant through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. She also works as a veterinary technician and cat groomer at Paws, Whiskers, and Claws, a feline-only veterinary hospital in Marietta, Georgia. Ingrid has been working exclusively with cats since 1999 and has had the opportunity to attend many continuing education courses all over the country. Her most passionate topic is environmental enrichment for indoor cats, which just so happens to make her the perfect guest for our show. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Ingrid on. Hi, Ingrid. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here tonight and being willing to share all your expertise with us. I will try to do my best. <laughs> so before we get into all the questions, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and your cats and all of that stuff? Absolutely. Well, I'm a hospital manager at a feline only clinic, but my main gig is fundamentally feline. And I created and, and started doing behavior consultations because just so many clients at the clinic needed more help than I could dedicate time to in the exam room. So I started doing home visits and home consultations. And then we started making things like scratching posts and food puzzle toys and litter boxes because my husband and I noticed, hey, all this stuff that we're recommending to people doesn't really exist unless we make it ourselves. So we started that ball rolling. And so we, we kind of have a lot of um, different irons in the fire when it comes to cats and cat behavior. Yeah, sounds like it. So cool. it's, it's a lot of fun, though, to have a lot of different diversity. Yeah. Yeah. So how many cats do you have? I currently have four cats. The four. fewest cats I've had in 20 years. Well, four is still pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we also have a rescued Great Pyrenees dog. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Do he's the guardian he... of the cats. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, how does he get along with the cats? He's wonderful. He's absolutely wonderful with them. And we actually adopted him for our cats because our cats like fuzzy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> big I have a cat that also loves big fuzzy dogs. <laughs> yeah. They have to groom the ears and head, you know, and if they don't have the right coat, it's just not as fun. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, this month through Kitty Cat Go, I'm hosting the Kitty Cat Go Adventure Challenge, which encourages people to go new places and try new things with their cat. And, you know, that can be a struggle when you're trying to yeah. take your cat somewhere new, somewhere they've never been or introduce them to a person they've never met. So can you give some tips and advice on how to properly introduce your cat to a new situation, whether it's just your backyard, the pet store, a restaurant patio, a park, you know, whatever. Sure. Yeah. But first, I just wanted to say that I think it's great that you're promoting this because I'm a big fan of outdoor exploration in a safe way. You know, we shouldn't just let them roam the neighborhoods, but I love cat strollers. I love catios. I love leash and harness walks. I love all the things that get them out and experiencing the seasons and the fresh air, but is making sure that they're safe. So I think it's great that you've got this going on. Um, and obviously we also have to recognize that every cat is not a candidate for this. And I think that that's pretty much a given. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you've got an adventure cat and you are approaching a new situation, my best advice is with most things with cats is take it slow too many people like just scoop them up and throw them on the ground and expect them to walk, you know, and it's their first time in a harness or it's their first time in a strange environment. And cats are a species that are both predator and prey. So they have to feel safe and secure or they're not going to move forward. So if they're showing hesitancy or they are reluctant to participate, we don't want to force it. We don't want to drag them by the leash. You know, we don't want to put them in those situations where they feel um, threatened. Mm -hmm. because that's going to make it negative for the next time. And it may also result in a cat that bolts. And my God, how terrible would it be to have them bolt away on a leash and harness and get tangled in something and you don't know where they are. Yeah. So taking it slow and being really cautious, I think is really imperative. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, 
and lots of positive reinforcement. Yeah. And I think too, on that note, it's important to understand that every cat's speed on how they adjust to those new situations is going to be different. Like I have seven cats and as you mentioned, not, not everybody, not every cat is suited. So out of my seven, only three go out on a harness and leash because the others just aren't comfortable with it, aren't into it. And each one of my three progress at such a different rate, you know? Right. Right. And I've, I mean, I even have some that I can take out in the yard, just like a little supervised excursion while we're taking out the recycling or something. And I trust them even out there naked, as we say, you know, Um, but if we're going to go out and spend time in the yard, you know, I do want them on their harnesses, but I I do feel comfortable enough that I'll let them, I'll drop the leashes and I'll let them just run around. We take out feather toys. You know, I think a lot of people forget about the fact that once they get acclimated to it and they're over the fact that you know, they don't want to just run out and eat grass anymore because let's be honest, that's all they want to do in the beginning. Uh, (laughs) But once they get used to it and they're into a rhythm, um, I think I see it as a great play space. And I live in a small home, so it's a way for them to really get a good run and tear and they've got good traction and purchase on the grass and soil versus our hardwood floors where they're skidding and sliding around. So I really like to use it as a place for interactive wand toys and play. Yeah, that's that's a great point. You know, I think sometimes a lot of people see all the posts of the cats out on the canoe or out on the hiking trail or camping and they think, oh, well, you know, my cat won't do that. And while that may be true, you know, going out on the backyard alone is a really big adventure and can be just as exciting. It's huge. And I mean, I think for a lot of cats, it's all they need and it's just enough because it takes a very special individual to go canoeing. But a lot of, I I think, you know, going, learning to get on their harness and go in the backyard. I mean, that's very much a happy medium. I mean, not your super skittish kitty, but a lot of cats can participate in that and enjoy that enrichment. And I think it's important that we start, I think we need to elevate our expectation of the cat. I mm-hmm. think we need to, ele- we, we, everyone should know how to, they should all wear har- harnesses. They should all wear collars. They should all have some deg- degree of training. Um, and if we did all of these things and treated them more like, God forbid, we say dogs, we're just treating them like the way cats should be treated. I hate it when people say, oh, he's just like a dog. I'm like, no, they're just like a cat. Yeah. <laughs> they're just an awesome cat. It doesn't yeah. mean that they're, you know, just because they fetch doesn't mean we have to compare them, you know, to a dog. Yeah. Not that I'm a speciesist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, as people are trying to get out there and go new places and try new things, at first their cat is probably going to be a little nervous or scared. What are some signs, like some body language signs yeah. that people can look out for to tell when their cat might be nervous? Well, a a really obvious one is like the guttural yowling and the trying to retreat and get away and hide. And I think, again, too many people force that. But if they are panting and they are yowling and they are trying to get back inside you, you know what I mean? They're so frantic. They're trying to crawl up you. I think it's really important that when you're in these situations that we have something to put the cat back into that they do feel safe in. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the kitty backpacks because they're so confining, but in that situation, that would be probably the perfect thing to use. Um, Or having like a cat stroller or a carrier, they've got to be able to respect their cat's limitations and be able to get them back into a safe space so that they feel safe. Um, But obviously, I mean, the, the, the usual signs that we see in a cat that is stressed, you know, pupils dilated, their ears are back, they're flicking, they're irritated, they're agitated. Um, but usually when they're scared, they really want to hide and get away and, Mm -hmm. and self-preserve. Right. Yeah. So we have to recognize that, um, you know, if we, if we force them into that situation too quickly, it's just going to make it so negative that they're never going to want to do it again. But if you bring a wand toy and treats and you lure them onto the restaurant patio, you know, that might create a much more positive association with that space and help them relax and help them chill out. Yeah. So what would you say to someone who maybe has had a really negative experience with their cat while out on, out on adventure or something traumatic? And maybe it was even a cat who previously was already well acclimated to hiking or whatever, and just some sort of freak thing happened. And now their cat's scared and skittish about going out. 
I would say that they have to back it up and restart the like a clicker training or positive reinforcement training process and start rebuilding the trust again. And they likely need to rebuild that trust in a, in a brand new area. I wouldn't take them back to the place where they had that really scary experience. I take them to a new space and it might be a long time before they ever go back to the place where they had the scary um, incident. They may never go back there. Um, but via clicker training or it doesn't have to be a clicker, you know, we can use a verbal verbal marker, but via training, I would have them slowly reacclimate them to the um, adventure. And I would just start with the backyard and I'd start with a short walk up and down the driveway. Same thing I tell people with a cat stroller, you know, just go and sit out in the yard in the cat stroller at first because the cat's just going to see it like a carrier and yeah. think that they're going to the vet. And then their first trip in the stroller is maybe just up and down the driveway. So same thing with the leash and harness is, you know, they might just walk around the block for a few times before we actually venture out to a place that is um, unfamiliar. But it's, you know, cats don't really, most cats, not all, but most cats are pretty intimidated in unfamiliar environments. Mm -hmm. And so I think that once again, the, the hit home here is to recognize when this is not appropriate for your pet, you know, to go beyond the yard or the neighborhood park. Yeah. You know, I think, I think because the adventure cat concept has become so popular, um, some people try to put their cats in situations where they are just, they're not ready or they're just never going to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I too, like you, you know, you've got three kitties that like it and the rest of them are like, nope. Yeah. Um, and I have some that don't like the stroller, but they love the leash and harness. Yeah. Which I actually found a little interesting. I thought everybody would dig the stroller. <laughs> um, so I just think we have to respect their limitations. Yeah. Yeah. And to that point, not just like the thing, the like methods they like to go out on, like harness and leash or backpack or stroller, but also the types of adventures. Like out of my three, mm -hmm. I have one who's a social butterfly and she loves to go to places where there's a lot of people and she will just walk up to everyone and be like, hi, you're my new best friend, right? That's and <laughs> yeah, and she loves dogs. Like, I mean, it's crazy. So she's pretty good and, you know, going to sit at a restaurant patio and eat dinner. She's cool to sit there and chill with all the commotion and everything like that. But my other two won't have any of that. They just right. like, be out in the woods on a quiet trail that doesn't have a lot of people, definitely no dogs. Right. And so, you know, finding the kind of adventure that your cat enjoys and going with that and not trying to force them into a, you know, a kind of adventure that they're uncomfortable with is important. Precisely. And I mean, your female cat is very unique in that. I mean, that is, I mean, again, even with cats loving the adventure, but the newness and the new people and walking up to strange dogs. I mean, that almost becomes a danger. Like you're like, Oh, this is great, yeah. but don't walk up to that dog. Yes, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. So, She's fearless to her detriment. Like I'm like, exactly. Sophie, you're going to get eaten. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think, I think spring and fall are really fun seasons and good times to start trying to acclimate them too, because there's so many fun scents, you know, in the summertime, it is just hot as blazes. I mean, we're in Georgia, so some other people may not experience that, but you know, it's, it's just, my cats start panting yeah. just being out in the yard in the evening with their harnesses mm -hmm. on. Um, so we have to be careful about that. And of course, winter time's not so fun. So I think spring and fall are really great seasons to uh, try to acclimate them to outdoor time, all the crunchy leaves, yeah. you know, I mean, that's fantastic fun. And all the, of course, great smells and, and blooming things of spring. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I have my adventure challenges in like usually April and October when the big okay. ones are, because that's when the weather's the best. So it's like easier to get out there and try all the things, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And I just, I just loved your little video at the intro. It's super cute. And to yeah. see all those kitties enjoying like climbing a real tree. I mean, what a blast that is. Yeah. One of mine climbs a tree in our yard and just goes up to the first little set of branches, you know, and it's just, something they don't get to do in a lot of homes, which is why I'm a big fan of the six foot scratch poles because I like them to have ways to climb the walls essentially in our house. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, those nails. <laughs> so another one of the obstacles that a lot of people run into with adventuring is not just introducing their cat to new places, but introducing them to new people. 
Um, mm. Or even just going somewhere where there are people, like going to the park and there's a lot of people around. Do you have any tips for dealing with that and how to get your cat used to being around people? Well, I think I would first start with maybe friends or neighbors. I would start with like the desensitizing process and I, I would I would set set the cat up for a mock intro, you know, so that you could start getting them acclimated close to home and see how they do. And, you know, give a neighbor or a friend, you know, some treats and have them, um, uh, have the cat approach them. Of course, we've got a lot of the cats to come to them. We don't want to go up and smother the kitties because yeah. everybody wants to go up and pick them up and those cats don't want that <laughs> you know they never want the they never want to be around the person that wants to smother them um so i would i would start small and close to home with strangers there because i think it's a high expectation mm -hmm. um and it's just not for every cat so if that's going well then i would say you go to a rather secluded maybe hiking trail where you hopefully don't run into anybody but if you do you know, you try to set those people up to set your cat up for success and be like, hey, you know, we've got our cat with us. Would you be willing to to meet us and give her some high value treats so that she realizes that these strangers we bump into on our path have something special and yeah. see how she goes with that. You know, bring bring yeah. like freeze dried chicken or something along. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've never thought of like asking the strangers to, to yeah. meet your cat. Yeah, I mean, you just gotta avoid them. <laughs> I mean, I do too, personally, and quite honestly, with dogs too. You know, most dogs don't want to be pet by strangers. Everybody wants to pet them, but that is not necessarily appropriate, and it's kind of insulting. And so, for cats, it's very much the same way, if not ten times more. Mm -hmm. So, let the cat come to them, and I would say, if the cat doesn't approach them, then that's that. It's their choice. Everything with cats has got to be about offering choice, and so we don't want to force anything. Right. You know, don't pick your cat up and put it into a stranger's arms. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Scenario people like to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a interesting scenario, but, you know, people with dogs, it's not uncommon to have play dates with dogs, to have a meetup at the park or, you know, bark in the park or whatever, those kinds of yeah. things, you know. Um, what about having some sort of meetup with a friend who also has an adventuring cat? How do you have any tips or advice on how to make something like that go smoothly? I don't know that that would go smoothly. Um, <laughs> cats, cats need to be gradually introduced to other cats over periods of days, weeks, or months. And so they generally do not welcome strangers so again there's exceptions to every rule so i can say that all day long but other you know some of your followers might have a cat that's totally fine with it like your kitty but generally it's something that has to be done gradually over time and is not going to be acclimated in you know just one adventure visit um unless you have that really special individual and to find two of those special individuals that can come together and be hospitable um that's pretty remarkable Right. Um, so generally that is not something that I would encourage or recommend not to mention communicable kitty cat diseases. If it's a stranger and we don't know, is your cat vaccinated properly? They're going to be out here getting exposed to all of these things. Mm -hmm. You know, do we want them going nose to nose? Do we want them spreading viruses and things like that? So, um, I think we have to be really cautious with that because generally cats reject newcomers initially. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's a tough situation. Yeah. Um, I like Sophie, I mentioned she uh, is pretty quick to befriend anybody or any kind of animal, yeah. but you no, know, my other cats, absolutely not. <laughs> like, ah. When I'm walking through the park with my stroller, I always mm -hmm. have, you know, my dog with me. And so people, they don't realize that I have cats in the stroller. They think I have children. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And they want to come up and talk to Sebastian. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, I've got cats in here. Just keep going. Like, <laughs> it's like got cats. No. Or their dog wants to come over and sniff the mm -hmm. stroller. I'm like, no, it's not happening. Yep. So yeah, I try to um, be boisterous about it and not allow them to approach so that I don't have chaos. Yeah. You know, yeah. That could go super poorly. <laughs> yeah. For those who are watching either on live or on the replay, if you have, um, you know, 
met up with either another person or a friend with the dog or a friend with the cat, let us know in the comments. Let us know how it went. Was it yeah. a disaster? Did it go well? You know, I'd love to, I always love to hear other people's experiences and, and how that went. Like that's always, I, I think about like taking the cats to like PetSmart or, you know, store mm -hmm. like you would with your dogs and just, you know, cruising down the aisle. You're probably not going to bump into another cat more than likely, yeah. probably bump into a dog. But um, I always just think about if the cats bumped into each other, the hissing and spitting match that might ensue, you know. So I actually try to actively avoid it personally just to make sure that they don't have a negative experience. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, going back to what we were talking about before, you don't want to put your cat in a situation where they could potentially have, where the potential is high for them to have a traumatizing experience. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just really try to keep it positive and safe. So I tend to avoid situations like that, which might make me a little bit of a Debbie Downer, but <laughs> I want to keep them going out on their harness. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, I understand. I, I, and that just goes back to like knowing your cat's limitations, you know, like I know that Sophie's okay with that stuff, but I know that Kylo is not. And so I don't take him to the pet store. I don't take him to busy places because I know, you know, he might freak out. The other thing that um, I like to do outside with them is clicker training. Mm. Taking, taking what you, they've learned in the house and applying it outdoors so mm -hmm. that they listen outside the way they did inside. I, I yeah. definitely want to teach them to come when called. That's a life-saving command for all species. Um, so yeah. I actually have a little video on my website about, you know, teaching your cat to come when called. And we practice, you know, around corners of the house and around shrubs. So they can't even see me and I call them. And then they, of course, get a reward, either, you know, feather play or treat reward when they get to me. And I like to keep that practiced up and going so that they are just as mindful outside as they are inside. And I, I started that with a cat that was actually a door bolter. And I was afraid that if he got out, you know, would he come to me? So I actually started clicker training him outside on the deck. Yeah. He's still a little naughty, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea. And, and so important, the strong recall skills, because yeah, there's no such thing as a 100% escape proof harness. And, no. you know, it's, you know, there's always the chance your cat will slip out. And if they're bol a bolter, you know, then yep, you're going to do. And they're, they're, I mean, they're always going to self-preserve. So that fight or flight kicks in and all of a sudden they just don't come to the sound of your voice. It's yeah. upsetting for us, but it's something we have to accept. It's cats. Mm -hmm. How they've survived for so many <laughs> millions of years so successfully, virtually unchanged since the beginning of time. Yeah. Because they are perfect. They came yeah. perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, seriously, there's just look at all the things we had to do to manipulate dogs. Yeah. Cats. We got some coat color changes, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they did exactly what we needed them to do right out the gate without any training or manipulation. Yeah. Um, well, we've got some comments coming in. People saying one person, Suzanne, says that they meet regularly at a park or brunch or even kayaking with friends. Um, Stephanie says that she finds that meetups go well until the other cat or dog gets scared and then her cat will respond the same way. Mm. Okay. Um, Momo and Appa say that Appa doesn't like other cats, but loves people and dogs. We've met other cat explorers and they're cool hanging out near each other, but usually just ignore each other. Yeah. Pretty so good. Keeping, <laughs> keeping a distance. I think that's pretty safe. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the humans can hang out everyone can have a little, little water break and granola snack. And then the cats are just at a distance on their leashes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stephanie asks, is it normal to take very long to respond to clicker training outside? Her kitty has it down inside, but not out. Hmm. I wonder if we're just too distracted. I would increase the value of the food reward. So whenever we're training, we have to find what I call a scale of rewards. And so lower value food reserved for learned behaviors or lower value things like just teaching sit or something that's not super important, but, you know, learning to go into your carrier on command or learning to come when called or just learning something really challenging, like jumping through your arms in a hoop, which is hard for a lot of cats to learn. Um, that kind of stuff. I increase the value. You've got to pay them more. Mm -hmm. So I would say that we need to find um, a higher currency for outdoor training. 
Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Work work harder for the better treats. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And maybe work in the um, part of the yard with the least um, distraction. So if we are a grass eater and all we want to do is eat grass, let's work on the deck mm -hmm. so that we take the trigger away that distracts them. Yeah. And I think, you know, that sort of goes back to what we were talking about, introducing your cat to new situations. You know, you do it slowly and probably works the same for clicker training, you know, just go right outside your door, you know, yep. like right on your front porch or front step and then gradually increase your distance. You probably going from inside to like the hiking trail is going to be, you know, too much of a jump. And don't forget about props too, like teaching them to go to um, targeting a mat or a click stick or a stool um, or a balance beam, mm -hmm. bringing something outside that's normally inside to try to keep them, keep their focus, you know, and in short, short sessions as well. You know, we're talking three to five minutes here. You know, we don't have to be clicker training. This is not a Labrador. We're not going to be out there for 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Teaching them the heel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you guys that are watching, feel free to drop your comments or your questions in the comments anytime. Um, you know, we'll be happy to, Take a look at those and help you as best we can. Um, I'd be I have, curious. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I'd be curious um, around Georgia, if we have any local um, people tuning in, where everybody goes with their kitties for their adventure hikes. That's a good question. And I did see back at the beginning of the show when people were chiming in with where they're from, we did have a, a person, April Lemons from Tucker, Georgia. So a fellow Georgian. Uh, Hi, April. Yeah. <laughs> um, so places that I take mine, we usually go, we have um, a couple hiking trails nearby that are pretty secluded. Um, okay. And so that's usually, those are our two big places. I try to avoid the parks because there's usually a lot of people, a lot of dogs, a lot of off leash dogs and, yes. you know, people not following the rules. So I avoid those kind of places and try to find the secluded hiking trails. Honestly, that's exactly what I was looking for because mm -hmm. I as much as we're talking about how to deal with cats coming across other cats, it's not something that I'm interested in. Um, I would like them to have their own little private adventure. And I was curious as to, you know, where, where people are finding those nice little spots where they hopefully don't bump into anyone else and have chaos ensue. Yeah. I find our spots on that all trails app. Um, I don't know if you've yep. that mm -hmm. before, but yeah, usually that will tell you, you know, how, if it's a highly traffic trail or not, if dogs are allowed or not. And, if they have to be leashed or not. So that's usually how I kind of gauge if it's going to be a good spot. Of course, it's not always right, but it of gives course. you a starting place. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I have a question about one of my cats, um, Kylo Ren. He really loves hiking. Like whenever loves he- Loves the comes, name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my husband is a big Star Wars fan and I've been converted. So okay. Yeah. Our black cat, Kylo Ren. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so he really loves hiking. He's been harnessed and leash trained for quite a few years now. He loves being out on the trail once he gets there. He will hike a lot of the way and is really into sniffing things, climbing the trees. But when we're getting ready to go on adventure, whenever he sees the harness come out, he goes and hides. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like mixed signals. He's clearly really loving it when we're out on an adventure, but for some reason he doesn't like it when he sees the harness come out. So I think we need to, we need to analyze that situation and break it down. So what about, what are the precursors to you getting the harness out? Like, is he scared of the car ride? Is there something else in that closet that you get out? Cause like my cats, as soon as I open the closet with the harnesses, they're screaming and they run to the screen door and they all are ready for their harnesses to get put on. So we have to look at like the antecedent. What is the precursor to that behavior that you think might be triggering him? And then we have to counter condition that. Yeah. Can you think of anything that might, um, anything else come out of that closet, like a vacuum? No, Maybe. no. I keep the harnesses in a room in my office and the cats don't go in there. Okay. Um, usually, you know, before I pull them out, it's my husband and I getting dressed and ready, putting on our hiking boots and, you know, getting the backpack out and then getting the harness out. And I don't How know. How is he during that part? 
Um, sometimes he'll hide before the harness even comes out. Like if wow. he's just putting our boots on and he's like, oh, we're about to go somewhere, I'm going to hide. Um, and then I can sometimes lure him out with treats and then get him in his carrier and then we go and then he has a great time. So it's just so strange. <laughs> so why don't you change up the orientation of how you do things? Change where you keep the harnesses. Maybe you get the harness on before you get the boots and the backpack and the car keys out. Is he scared to go to the vet? Um, no, not usually. He doesn't cry in the car? No. No, he's a pretty good car rider. He just Okay. Okay. Um, so just alter the ori orientation of how you go about cuz like he's gotten used to the pattern. Mm -hmm. And the pattern obviously gets him a little amped up. So there's something about that that I, I don't know what it is um that's making him fearful. Yeah. And so if we alter that and we change it, then perhaps we don't cue him in as to what is about to occur. So he's not um, scared. Mm -hmm. Then also, how did you first condition him to wearing the harness? Was that a pretty positive experience or does he get freaked out when you first put it on? No, he's pretty good with the harness. And I to try to work uh, on this issue, I've been doing a lot of getting the harness out when we're not even going to go anywhere. Yes. You know, getting it out, putting it on him, giving him treats, clicker, you know, clicker training with the harness. And that's been helping. Um, but we just haven't fully conquered the issue. So, <laughs> and, and you might want to take that, you know, one step further through once you get him used to you getting the harness out and clicker training that, and he doesn't care and doesn't run anymore. Then the next step is move on to the next, the next cue. The, is it the shoes? Is it the boots? Is it the backpack? And you mm. have to do that counter conditioning with each and every item that seems to trigger oh. him to bolt. So the harness is phase one, and maybe you do store it somewhere else and counter condition it and make it super positive. But then we also have to do the same thing with all of the other things that seem to make him go, oh, got to go under the bed. Yeah. You know, um, so it's 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 strange that he he does he, he really does enjoy it. It's not like yeah, he's like, like okay. happy tail up, very engaged and okay. like, treats. He'll eat, drink, do all those things that shows that he's comfortable and he's really affectionate and, uh, you know, definitely happy when we're out on the trail. I can tell when he's not, you know, because sometimes we have a backpack carrier and if he's not into it, he won't come out of his backpack, you know, okay. and then I know uh, he's not into it today. But other times he's like, let me out. I want to get down there and explore. You know? Is this the one I saw in the Star Wars vest? Yes. <laughs> This is um this is Vader behind me. You can't totally see him oh, there, yeah. but um, <laughs> we've also embraced the the Star Wars theme. And um, ironically, at age nine, he developed a tumor and had the exactly correct front limb removed. Oh, who knew that was going to happen? So it's hey. almost like we cursed him. <laughs> Following <laughs> after his namesake, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have another cat. His name is Soren, and we call him Ren. So oh, and the. Cool. the yeah, because of Kylo Ren. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would work on counter conditioning some of those um, precursors that get him triggered. Yeah, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of doing all the other things. I've been working on counter conditioning with the harness, but not all of the other steps. And yeah. I'm seeing now that a couple other people have chimed in to say they have the same problem with their cats. Like, well, we do the same the thing harness, like this. with like separation anxiety. You know, they hear the keys, you get your purse. Yeah it starts. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation is to kind of throw off those cues that you're about to leave mm -hmm. and, or keep them distracted through those cues. So they're not as turned on by them. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, same, same kind of concept. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Allison has asked, how do you become a cat behaviorist? Oh, well, it depends on which avenue you want to take. Um, you can go to vet school <laughs> and become a veterinarian and then become a board certified veterinary behaviorist, which is far fancier than I am. Um, many more letters after the name. Um, <laughs> for me, I personally worked in feline only clinics. Um, well, since 1999, as my bio suggests. And um, I just always had more of an interest in why they do what they do versus why does that organ function that way? Um, I like all of it, but I definitely had a gravitation towards behavior. So I went to a lot of um, conferences, veterinary conferences I was fortunate to go to and learn from some of the, the gurus. Um, and then I found the IAABC and I simply started the process, the ball rolling to become a behavior consultant. There's different um, tiers 
of consulting, um, depending on how much experience you have. And you have to, of course, complete a, um, a test. You have to, you know, you have to pass and you have to show so many hours of consulting experience um, and present case studies. So you definitely have to more than love cats because <laughs> everybody's like, I want to do it because I like cats. <laughs> yeah. So um, you definitely have to have some experience before you can get your foot in the door to even apply. Very but, interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a good program though. And, um, you know, some people just join the group just to become a supporting member, just so that they can talk cat behavior and learn more from others. And so mm -hmm. that's usually a way to, uh, gather more information and decide if that's right for you and see if you want to pursue it further. There yeah. are some courses you can take, but none of them are going to, um, none of them are vet school courses. It's not the same. And I've, I've not done those. How long did the whole process take you? Um, you're given three months to complete the certification, uh, case studies and exam and the whole deal. Wow. That's pretty quick. Yeah. And, um, well, you have to, it's, it's kind of like, you don't, you don't want to get started with it before you already have, you like, you know, you're going to have references, you know, who your case studies are going to be. It's basically the time it takes to write everything up and mm -hmm. get your ducks in a row. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. You really probably shouldn't start that uh, clock ticking if you don't already have an idea of what you're going to put into the application. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very so. Cool. But it's a labor of love and it can be hard sometimes because there's a lot of pressure, you know, sometimes yeah. if you don't fix problems, you know, the worst happens. And mm -hmm. so there's a definitely a lot of pressure to fix it and fix it fast. And the humans are the hurdle. Uh, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Getting, getting the humans to add a litter box in a place where they don't want a litter box is tough sometimes. Mm hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, well, kind of going back to my question about being scared of the harness, but loving adventure, Stephanie says yeah. she has the opposite problem. She says that Kitty is so excited to go out that they'll try and dart even when they're not going out on an adventure. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice for that? Yeah. So if they're a door bolter, first and foremost, that that's, that's the first behavior we have to train and shut down. And just a, a real quick fix there is maybe living with it temporarily. If it's a real flight risk and you live on a busy road or something, um, even a baby gate across the doorway threshold. So if they were to bolt, they're going to hit the gate and they're not going to get out quickly. Um, collars and bells so that you know that they're coming. Um, I had one who used to like to run out underneath my hundred pound dogs and you would never know that he was there. So uh -huh. lots of bling and lots of jingle. Um, but then that can also be trained. You can train them to go station. So like when it's time to go out the door, they go to their mat and they sit. And so we teach an alternative behavior that's not compatible with running out the door. And um, one of your previous guests can help them a lot with that. <laughs> really? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we're talking about, I think it's episode three. If anyone wants to go back and watch it, my March episode, I had Julie Poslins from uh, cat school. She does clicker training. So you should go check that episode out. <laughs> yeah, she's fantastic and is a great resource for everyone. If they want to learn more about training, um, the trainable cat book is also fantastic by um, Sarah Ellis and John Bradshaw. Um, really great book on training cats. So if we teach an incompatible behavior, that's not compatible with bolting out the door. That's our first and foremost thing. Go to your mat and sit, get a treat and let me exit so that we stop that behavior. Um, but then, you know, my cats actually don't run outside and I am thrilled because I am very, very strict about, they go out when I decide they go out, mm -hmm. they never go out when they're meowing, when they're crying at the door and they're hovering, they're circling, they're getting all excited. They, you, you never want to reinforce that. It's just like the waking you up in the, in the middle of the night thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you don't want to wake up, don't talk to them, don't pet them. Don't open your eyes. Don't do anything. Be yeah. a corpse and roll over. They get nothing from trying to wake you. And they will get worse before they get better. And then eventually they will give up because they realize it gets them nothing. So um, we have a cat that actually goes out almost every morning with my husband while he eats breakfast as long as it's a nice day. But on the rainy days, we don't want him crying at the door. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't because we invite him outside. He doesn't yeah. dictate it. And I think a lot of cats get into the door bolting situation because it has been um, 
too easy for them and or reinforced. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing that I always am sure to do is I don't let my cats walk out the door on their own. I always yes. carry them out. So that way they don't see crossing the threshold as something that they can do. Yes. And that is, that is actually a recommendation that I've made for probably many, many years recently. I've kind of let that I, I, I kind of forget about that recommendation, but I used to tell people, if you're going to take your cat on a leash and harness, first they go in their carrier. You take them outside through a door that they're not accustomed to leaving. So say you go out through like the kitchen door into the garage and then outside. So mm. it's double door and they never get to, like bolting out into the garage is boring. It's no fun. And so you don't go out like the door that you use every day. Yeah. You go out a, another door in the carrier and then you let them out of the carrier and you let them into the grass that way. Yeah. So that hmm. they never learn that crossing the threshold is safe. Yeah. Good idea. I hadn't thought about the alternate route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's good to brainstorm. Hopefully yeah. people are learning different things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Karen says that her cat Yuli um, loves his harness, climbs in her lap when it comes out, loves car rides and being on the trail, but he's skittish of his backpack ever mm -hmm. since some rude hikers threw rocks at him when he was in it. Do you have any, um, any way to help him believe his wow. backpack is a safe space again? Wow. People are horrible. That's awful. Yeah. How do you do that? And I mean, basically they're throwing rocks at the human too. The human, yeah. yeah. Um, Honestly, usually in situations like that, like when we tell people with vet visits, you're going to try to train your cat to a carrier, you get a brand new carrier that's mm -hmm. never been associated with anything negative. And so there's not a ton of cat backpacks out there, but I would try to find one that looks different, smells different, and is totally different in every way and retrain him to accept the backpack. That's usually one of your best ways to go about doing that is just getting a fresh, clean slate, just like you would with a cat carrier. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, a, that's a good thought. You know, I always think about, you know, you just start the training process over again. But if sometimes, like, if that one is ruined in their mind, like you were mm -hmm. saying, how if they have a traumatic experience at a location, they may never be comfortable going to that location again. And that could be exactly. true with the backpacks as well. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, like with cat carriers, we always tell them get something brand new that's never been to the vet. It does not have any scent on it and break it down. If you can, you know, leave the backpack as open as possible and you want to reward exiting as well as entering. So it's just as fun to do both behaviors. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, getting in there that gets them the reward. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> Good questions too. Everybody's got yeah. some I have a lot of questions here. That's excellent. I can't believe somebody threw rocks at the cat in the backpack. That's, I can't either. That's insane. Another reason to find a secluded trail, not worrying about your cat bumping into anyone. Right? Yeah. I have... Yeah. People, it's amazing sometimes I, the things you hear. <laughs> I, I Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by that, honestly. I'm sorry. We're like, I'm going to pause for a, a moment of... <laughs> yeah 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 um i mean i don't even i take my cats down to the park in the strollers mm -hmm. but i don't take them out of the stroller in the park because yeah it's just too much hubbub mm -hmm. you know yeah yep well if you guys have any more questions be sure to drop them in the comments but i am gonna go ahead and drop uh ingrid's links she can be found let me get my little banner. She can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Fundament Fundamentally Feline and on her website, fundamentallyfeline.com, where you can find some of her really awesome products. She makes uh, enrichment toys and things like that. So definitely check that out. And I have links to these things that I can drop in the comments for all you viewers. So you can easily find them just dropped her facebook page Aww, link thank you and her instagram link and her website link so go follow her and look at all of her awesome stuff because it thank is you. super great um we did have another question okay so any ideas for a dog aggressive cat not the best idea to challenge random dogs yet he does 
Wow. Yeah. Okay. I would say, um, and that's because you can't, you don't have time to train or desensitize the cat in that situation. So I think in that situation, you've got to have a secure place to, to, to swoop them up and, and remove them from the situation. Cause that's a safety issue. I mean, we're talking life or death at that situation, you know, yeah. well, the dog could lose an eye. Let's be honest. <laughs> Um, not, cats are tough. <laughs> I'm not saying it's funny. I'm just saying that the cats do have weapons, but yes. ultimately, you know, you don't want to run up to a hundred pound dog and start attacking it. That's going to be, that's, that's seriously dangerous. And there's no time to, to train that out of them in that, especially if they're fine with some dogs and then just randomly not others. Yeah. You know, and sometimes those cats it's happened because they've had a bad experience. They've been chased, they've been attacked, they've been, you know, rolled and, who knows what, what's been done to them that makes them fearful of dogs. And so they're offensively aggressive. You don't want to trim their nails. They need their weapons. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I would, I would say, remove them from the situation. Don't try to fix it. Yeah. Good. Safety first. Safety first always. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for anyone watching, I've mentioned the adventure challenge that I am hosting this month. I'm going to drop the link to that too, if you'd like to check it out. Um, it's a fun little way to get out and get new ideas of things to try with your cat. Um, there's tasks from for those who have never harnessed and leash trained their cat to those who are really advanced and go camping with their cat. So tasks for everybody and um, there's fun prizes too. And so I, you can check out that link to get more information if you'd like to join. Um, but unless anyone has any more questions or unless you have anything you'd like to add, we'll start wrapping things up. I think the only other thing I want to add is for the families whose kitties don't do this or for your, your four that stay inside yeah. is this is a great time of year to bring the outdoors in. And I'm a really big fan of that for the enrichment side of things. I know this is not talking about harnesses and, and going on adventures necessarily, but mm -hmm. you know, those cats that are wallflowers or that are too afraid, they need that fun too. Mm -hmm. And so I love to bring in, you know, boxes of dried leaves. Um, you can throw treats in the dried leaves. So it's like a rooting box for cats. Um, you can put toys in there. You can put um, hex bugs. If everybody knows the little teeny tiny battery operated bugs you can get on Amazon. Oh, yeah, those are great. You put that in a box with some dried leaves. It's like there's real prey in there. Very yeah. exciting stuff. You know, I bring in, um, I just was out of town last week and I brought back a piece of driftwood from the beach and I brought back some pine cones from the beach for scent enrichment. And then of course the pine cones lose their, lose interest. And then that piece of driftwood remains an awesome scratching product for the rest of eternity in this house, which is really fun and a different substrate for them to use. Yeah. Bringing in branches that have fallen in the yard with leaves on them and hiding food treats around, turning it into a little bit of a foraging experience. Uh, bring in snow if we are lucky enough to get some, um, put on a cookie sheet bring in a cookie sheet of snow. Um, but at pine straw, I mean, whatever you're willing to bring inside, you can put it in an under the bed storage tote. You can put it in a cardboard box, um, screen porch. If you want to maintain the mess, if you have a screen porch, put it out there, but if not, just let them enjoy it. Let them feel those sensations of the crinkly leaves and smell those smells. And I think it's important for them to have the chance to experience the seasons. Yeah. Those are all really great ideas. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, thank you so much for joining tonight, for being on the show, sharing all your knowledge. I know that, you know, I've got a lot of good nuggets of information and oh, I yeah. hope everybody did as well. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I guess that's it for tonight, everybody. If you have any more questions or want to continue any discussions, be sure to join our Facebook group, Kitty Cat Go Adventure Team. Um, our next episode of Kitty Cat Go Live will be um, Wednesday, November 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we'll be chatting with Terry Lukens Gable of Adami the Abbey about establishing the National Park Service Meow Ranger Program. There's already a Bark Ranger Program, and she's working with them to establish a Meow Ranger Program, which is super awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So mark your calendars, and uh, I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.